The Kuroshio, also known as the Japan Current, carried the helpless and unsteerable ship along in its tow. The ship was pulled across the Pacific by the current, and even though the pull weakened near Hawaii, the Hojun Maru and the men on board of her were still carried up the coast towards what is now Washington State. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the three lost sailors of Hojun Maru? Here we are. Enjoy! The voyage of the Hojun Maru began in October 1832 from Nagoya with a crew entirely from the village of Anoura. The intention was to take the 15-meter-long Hojun Maru, a type of cargo ship called a Sengoku Bune, to Ido with a cargo of rice and porcelain. In total, the cargo was estimated at around 150 tons. It was a trip of less than 400 miles, but they would never make it. With Japan having had strict isolationist policies in place since the 1600s, there was little incentive to build ships that could manage heavy open seas. Sengoku bune were built with coastal trading in mind, with rudders that could be raised and lowered according to water depth. This versatility was also a weakness, though, and they tended to break in heavy seas like the one that hit the Hojun Maru soon after they began their voyage. As the storm continued to rage, the ship's mast soon followed the rudder leaving the ship unable to be steered and entirely at the mercy of the seas. The Hojun Maru was quickly swept further and further from the coast of Japan. The crew survived the initial storm that blew them off course, and there was no concern about food or water. The 14-man crew had a cargo full of rice to live off of, and they found it easy to catch enough water to drink. It is likely that at least some of the crew was related to one another. They all came from the same village, and trades ran in families. The disappearance of the Hojan Maru would be a blow to Onaura, where their families would have no way of knowing that rather than having sank, the ship was slowly drifting across the sea. Years later, a gravestone was found by researchers with the names of all of the crew members engraved on it, since their families assumed that the ship had no survivors. Though starvation was not a danger, the lack of any fresh fruit or vegetables did eventually take its toll. One by one, members of the crew came down the scurvy and were buried at sea. The men on the Hojun Maru had no way of knowing when they were going to make landfall or where they were headed. They could only watch as their fellow crewmates fell sick, and they had no means to render aid. Sources differ whether it was 14 or 16 months after they had left Nagoya that the battered and broken Hojan Maru grounded on some rocks on the coast of modern Washington state, most likely near or at Cape Alava. Only three men of the original crew were still alive. The ship's navigator, Iwakichi, who was age 28, and two of the youngest members of the crew, Kiyukichi and Otokichi, who were 15 and 14 respectively. The three of them managed to reach the shore and were almost immediately found by a group of Maka seal hunters. Their reception was not a particularly friendly one by the Maka. They were strangers, and there was a strong language barrier between the two groups. The Japanese castaways were taken prisoner and enslaved, a common practice at the time, while the Hojan Maru began breaking up before the Maka could pull much off of it. The three men would spend the remaining winter and spring gathering shellfish, seaweed, and berries. The Maka often traded with Hudson Bay Company and rumors began to reach Fort Vancouver that a vessel had been wrecked during the winter. It was not until the spring that a piece of paper reached John McLaughlin, the chief factor of Fort Vancouver. It showed a boat jammed against the rocks, 
and three shipwrecked sailors. Written alongside was what McLaughlin assumed were Chinese characters. He also heard from the Maka that the ship was loaded with what he referred to as Chinaware. In March, McLaughlin dispatched his stepson to bring the castaways to Fort Vancouver, but the weather and landscape hindered him. In May, McLaughlin sent Captain McNeil, in charge of the Hudson Bay Company vessel the Lama, to bring the three survivors by sea. This mission included paying the Maka a ransom for the shipwrecked sailors. In July, McNeil delivered the three Japanese sailors to Fort Vancouver. Though McLaughlin had imagined using three castaway Chinese sailors as a tool to gain favor and diplomatic power for the Hudson Bay Company in trades with China, he was not disappointed to find that they were Japanese. He wrote to company officials in London that he believed that these were the first Japanese who have been in the power of the British nation. He went on to suggest the British government would gladly avail itself to this opportunity to endeavor to open a communication with the Japanese government. In the meantime, the three survivors of the Hojan Maru found a temporary home in Fort Vancouver. Now referred to as the Three Kichis due to the appearance of that syllable in all three of their names, they were housed, fed, and sent to join the other students of the fort in learning English. Their teacher would later say that they learned quickly and were studious. He also noted that he was teaching them about Christianity, most likely not realizing that if the goal was to return them to Japan, this would be a mistake, since Christianity had not been welcome in Japan for some time by 1834. In November of 1834, McLaughlin sent Iwakichi, Kyukichi, and Otokichi in the direction of London on board of the Hudson Bay Company ship the Eagle. He sent a letter to accompany them. In it, he explained his actions in sending them to London, even though the Eagle was making a stop in Hawaii, which would be a closer place to drop them off if they were returned to Japan. It was McLaughlin's plan that the three castaways would see the capital of England in all of its grandeur and bring word of it back to their government when they returned home. McLaughlin saw the three castaways as a wedge that could potentially open a path into isolationist Japan. He sent with them the board that had the Hojan Maru's name carved into it, as well as the Hojan Maru's compass, thinking that they would be interesting souvenirs for the authorities in London. For all of McLaughlin's hopes and dreams, those in London were far less interested in attempting to large trade operations with Japan, since they were still focused on China. It is possible that those in London were more aware than McLaughlin, that rather than welcoming back castaways who had encountered Europeans, Japan instead rejected them, thinking of them as contaminated. McLaughlin would receive a letter from the Hudson Bay Company offices in London chiding him for sending the three Japanese sailors to England, rather than simply dropping them off in Hawaii and making them find their own way home. Since they were in England, the company was forced to do something with them. Iwakichi, Kyokichi, and Otokichi would make history when they became the first known instance of Japanese citizens to walk English streets, but they were only allowed to do so for one day. For the remaining week and a half, the three castaways were confined aboard the Eagle. After their day ashore, the three men were placed on another ship for the next leg of their journey. But rather than going to Japan, the ship was headed to Macau. Macau was as close to home as the English would agree to transport them. This time at the expense of His Majesty, King William IV of England. Though Macau might have seemed as though it was close to Japan for the English authorities, it was far from the home they wanted to return to for the three shipwrecked sailors. The three of them were placed in the care of Karl Gutzlaff, a German missionary who continued to teach them English. In exchange, the three sailors were put to work by Gutzlaff, who wanted to print a Bible in Japanese. The project was doomed to fail. Though a volume was published, it was quickly withdrawn from the market due to inaccuracies, and has now become a sought-after collector's piece. 
that the three castaways were sailors and not scholars, and Gutzlav's specialty was Chinese and not Japanese, contributed to the translation's failure. During this time, the support for Iwakichi, Kiyokichi, and Otokichi was paid for by the British consul and trade commissioner in Macau, but after two years, this support was withdrawn. No effort had been made to return the three Japanese sailors to Japan, and it was beginning to look as though they would never see Japan again. That was until four more Japanese sailors arrived in Macau. The four newcomers had been shipwrecked in the Philippines, and had been rescued by an American merchant named Charles King. Like McLaughlin before him, Charles King saw the Japanese castaways as a chance to make contact with Japan. Loading all seven of the castaways onto his ship, the Morrison, in July 1837, they headed towards Japan. If the Japanese sailors had expected a warm welcome, they were to be disappointed. Twice they attempted to make landfall, and twice they were met with cannon fire. The Morrison was slightly damaged by a cannonball, and they were forced to give up on the idea of landing in Japan. This was an especially painful rejection for the Japanese castaways, who had come within sight of their home nation for the first time in years. The Japanese sailors, coming to the realization that they would not be welcomed back in Japan, instead began to try to make new lives for themselves. Most of the sailors would disappear from history after this final rejection and return to Macau. But Otokichi would go on to be at the right place at the right time. China was slowly opening up to trade, and in 1842, Otokichi moved from Macau to Shanghai and started working for a trading company. Once he had given up on returning to Japan, Otokichi had adopted the name John Matthew Otteson. But as he gained a greater knowledge of Chinese, he also took the name Lin Atao. With his knowledge of Japanese, English, and Chinese, Otokichi began to make a name for himself as an interpreter. After Admiral Perry had forced Japan to open its doors, the British quickly followed. Since they already had used Otokichi as a translator, It only made sense for them to hire him when the British started negotiations to open the port of Nagasaki to English trade in 1854. As a symbol of their willingness to work with the British, the Japanese government made an offer. They would allow Otokichi to return to Japan. He refused. He had been 14 when he had left Japan, and the earlier rejection when he had attempted to return home was not forgotten. Not only that, but Otokichi had rebuilt his life and started a family after leaving Japan. He had little incentive to give up what he had worked for. Otokichi instead accepted British citizenship as his reward for his interpretation work and relocated his family to Singapore to escape the instability of the Taiping Rebellion in China. This made him Singapore's first Japanese resident. As Japan began to send diplomatic missions to Europe, Singapore was a frequent stopping point on their voyage. Otokichi's home became a place for these Japanese diplomats to stop, and incredibly powerful Japanese politicians would pass through his door. Otokichi's home was described as pleasant, and his success was apparent to his visitors. Otokichi passed away at the age of 50 of tuberculosis and was buried in Singapore. In 2004, He was exhumed and cremated, and a portion of his ashes were brought back to Japan. A part of these ashes were given to his last known relative in Japan, and a portion were buried at the gravestone for himself and his comrades that had stood at an empty grave for so long. Otokichi had finally returned to Japan. The ramifications of the wreck of the Hojan Maru continued to be felt in the world, though, even before Japan opened its doors to the world. Back in Fort Vancouver area, a man named Reynald MacDonald was beginning to make a plan, one that was sparked by stories of Japanese castaways. The half Chinook son of a high ranking Hudson Bay Company officer, MacDonald, had only barely missed meeting the survivors of the Hojan Maru 
Indeed, for years, people assumed they must have met. MacDonald family records, however, show that MacDonald's family left Fort Vancouver shortly before the shipwrecked survivors arrived. This did not mean that he did not hear about the three Japanese men, though, and he began to think about how he could see Japan. MacDonald was aware that there was a chance of being put to death if he trespassed into Japan, but this did not dissuade him. MacDonald joined the crew of a New England whaling ship that would be sailing to the waters around Japan. And he and the captain reached a secret agreement that he would be set adrift near Japan to try his luck. MacDonald was not going empty handed. He brought books. He intended to offer his services as an English instructor. He had a good education and had graduated from a college in Winnipeg. If nothing else, his credentials were good to offer himself as a teacher. MacDonald's plan was surprisingly successful. Originally made a prisoner in Hokkaido, he was soon sent to Nagasaki to teach the scholars who were learning Dutch and English. Japan knew very well that eventually they were going to be forced to make contact with the outside world. There was too much pressure on them from the outside for their isolationist policies to remain forever. It would be to their benefit to have some of their population who could act as translators. There was also some speculation that the fact that MacDonald was not European worked to his advantage. For the next year, MacDonald worked as the first English teacher in Japan, and at least one of his students, Moriyama Ainosuke, would play an incredibly important role in later negotiations between the English speaking world and Japan. After a year, MacDonald was sent to Hong Kong, and after a small tour of Asia and Europe, MacDonald returned to Canada. In his memoirs, he would speak on what an inspiration the story of the Three Kichis had been to him ever setting out to see Japan. In Mihama, the place of origin for the crew of the Hojan Maru, the story of the three sailors who traveled around the world after starting out for a short voyage is an important one. Several times, people from Mihama have traveled to see the Fort Vancouver area, as well as to offer their thanks to the Maka tribe. Though the three survivors of the Hojan Maru were initially taken captive, it is acknowledged that it is unlikely they would have survived at all if they had not been found by the Maka. The story of the three castaways, and especially Otokichi, has been told many times over the years. It appears in books and plays. And most strangely, in a 1983 Japanese movie. The movie Kaire, which means Adrift at Sea cost close to $4 million to make, but only several hundred people went to see it in theaters. A good part of that budget is probably explained by the fact that it features Johnny Cash as McLaughlin. Johnny Cash wears a wig and strums his guitar as he meets Iwakichi, Kiyukichi, and Otokichi. This was apparently not enough to fill theaters, and the movie is largely forgotten. For an interesting read about Ronald McDonald, Please see Native American in the Land of the Shogun by Frederick L. Schott, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.